Well, hello there and welcome to the recording of um, episode 2.14 of Marketing Scoop. We're going to get going with the proper, more formal introduction in the next three or four minutes, but um, we like to give people just um, an opportunity to join in and um, see what's happening here before we actually start the show a proper. It's always good to um, feel um, what the audience um, are up to and um, get a feel for the, the kind of topics that are of interest to you. So the, the topic of conversation today is going to be social media content that converts. We have a different area of focus each Marketing Scoop episode. Um, this one is on content, so that's why we're talking about social media content. Um, other themed episodes are SEO, advertising, and uh, success stories, as well as this content ones. So we go through a loop of those four different styles of episodes. Um, so we've got, already got some people watching us live. Howdy, thank you so much for joining us live. Great to have you here. Um, if that content resonates with you, tell us a little bit about how you think about social media content and perhaps um, a little bit about your strategy if you'd like to share that in the comments. And of course, um, share a little bit about where in the world you happen to be, um, a little bit about perhaps what you had for lunch. Um, one of our guests was sharing that earlier on. We might get some um, his um his lunch story um, in the next couple of minutes if um, we don't get enough comments um coming in in terms of um what you've had for lunch and of course what um is of interest to you in terms of social media content that converts i mentioned um this is this marketing scoop podcast um it's recorded live on youtube if you're not an active subscriber to the audio podcast you should subscribe to that so just go over to etiumrush.com slash podcast and you will find a link there to whatever your preferred flavor of podcatcher is. Could be iTunes, Android, Stitcher, Overcast, Spotify. The links are all on there on the landing page, semrush.com slash podcast. And um, we've got a few people um, starting to interact in the comments now. Um, Carlos, hello everyone watching here from Mexico. Carlos, great to have you on here. What time is it in Mexico at the moment? Um, we've got um, one of the co-hosts, in fact, the only other um, co-host, um, saying hello everyone, still enjoying Christmas chocolate in the UK. Um, hopefully she'll um, also be doing a little bit of co-hosting as well as um, lunching on. <laughs> Chocolate. I, when, when my mouth is not full of chocolate, of course, I'll be doing co-hosting. <laughs> and and oh. I was enjoying good British chocolate as well. So made in Devon. Good. Dev Devon, and that's where one of our um, guests is from. Um, uh, Julia, we'll give you the the proper introduction in a second. But um, have you been um, eating Devon chocolate recently? Me? Uh, yeah, I have actually. <laughs> <laughs> Dark chocolate because I'm vegan. But yes, there's some very nice chocolate from around here. Wow. Very impressive. And um, we might as well say hello to Ian quickly, who's uh, just finished your lunch recently, or was that a while ago, Ian? No, that was that was a while ago. I was going to say, isn't that what social media is all about, sharing what you had for breakfast and lunch? Yeah. How do you yeah, measure the conversion much. on that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe your local restaurant can uh, measure the conversion. Maybe. I sell a lot of maybe. chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I've got a bit I've got a bit hardcore with with chocolate and I uh, I have 100% dark chocolate which Ooh, is wow. which is pretty yeah it's That's a quite quiet intense. taste yeah <laughs> have you had the um chocolate madagascar 100% chocolate oh my I, I don't know it I've won had... oh right it won the golden bean from the academy of chocolate whose judging is starting up again, I can't believe it already in, in a short time, but it's the highest accolade possible. Only one chocolate, milk, white, dark, whatever, is awarded the golden bean in any one year. And they won it the year before last for their 100%. So definitely wow. chocolate Madagascar, if you can, wow. for their 100%. We're not hearing I, didn't, I didn't. Judging. I didn't think I'd learn that in, in this uh, webinar, but I, I, I need to find out more about that. <laughs> <laughs> I like. I think I'm getting into chocolate a little bit more. I tried dark chocolate with sea salt, Ooh, um, yes. and I wasn't overly enamored by it actually. But I'm, I'm sure I've got to try some different flavors in there just to to find the one that really suits me. Yeah, I'll have to send brand. you some. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, there's there's the Devon Willie's Cacao in Devon. Oh. Um, he's a, a major producer. You'll see him in supermarkets as well. But he uses beans traded directly with farmers. Um, there's also in I think it's Cleethorpes Duffy's Red Star. He buys again from farmers. Um, there, there's stuff all over in us uh, Edinburgh. I think they're in Edinburgh, not Glasgow. Is um, the Chocolate Tree, and they oh. also make their own 
chocolate from the bean to bar. So I, there's tons all over the UK. So um, people buying direct from farmers as well. So mm. super ethical and very healthy and good for you because it's made without adding palm oil. And the Marketing Scoop podcast is brought to you by... <laughs> Sponsored by chocolate in general. <laughs> I think we'll, we should probably get going with the <laughs> actual topic. But um, we've, we've got um, 20 over 10 um, joining us from Riley, um, New York City, I think that is. Happy New Year. And um, we've got Carlos saying that um, in Mexico it's... Um, I lost um, what he was saying. Oh, yes, a little bit um, cold weather, although the sunlight most part of the day. I'm sure it's um, warmer in Mexico than than the UK where yeah. we're all joining from. But um, let's, uh, we've started the audio recording, so obviously that bit won't be as part of the, um, the audio podcast. Another fantastic reason to subscribe to the audio podcast. You won't have to listen to that nonsense at the beginning. <laughs> <But> <laughs> so let's, let's get going with the proper intro. Uh, here we go. Marketing Scoop Season 2, Episode 14, Social Media Content That Converts. Broadcasting live on the SEM Rush YouTube channel, this is Marketing Scoop. I'm David Bain. And I'm Judith Lewis. And welcome to the SEM Rush show that reveals the latest digital trends and technologies that impact your marketing strategy. Together with industry experts, we delve into SEO, advertising, and content marketing to uncover the ultimate recipe for digital marketing success. So let's meet today's guests. First up, a man who puts the seriously back into social. He's an international speaker, trainer, teacher, and consultant, and the founder of the Confident Live Marketing Academy. Welcome to The Scoop, Ian Anderson Gray. Thanks, David. Did that take you uh, a few hours to come up with that? I love that, that Did intro. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And now you're going to use it as a Twitter bio, I hope. <laughs> yeah, <I'm, laughs> I'll, I'll send you the money later. <laughs> uh, next up, a lady who brings her skills from a career in forensic science to the world of social media marketing. She's a strategist, a speaker, and a trainer for micro and small businesses, focusing in on business growth through creating real human connections. Please welcome the founder of Bramble Buzz, Julia Bramble. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. Fantastic. Thank you for joining us. Um, so let's get started with um, you first, Julia. Um, how actionable can social media really be? How actionable can it be? I think social media for most businesses has got to be up there as part of their marketing toolkit. I mean, maybe three, four years ago, you had businesses who were saying, mm, still don't know whether I should be on social media or not. But now it's such an integral part of our lives that if you're not, you are seriously missing out because we know that the whole world and her dog is on social media. So it's not kind of how actionable, it just, it has to be actionable for your business. So whether you like it or not, you're going to have to be on social media to be a serious business in today's climate. Absolutely. And of course, there's the the argument from you work with micro and small businesses, time. Yeah. So I know that that can be a real issue for small and micro businesses. Um, if it's that essential and, and that important for businesses to be on social media, if they must be there 100%, what do you do about um, advising them around time? Well, if we look at it this way, all, social, all, all businesses need customers or clients. So all businesses need some form of marketing to go out and let the world know about their products or services. So they attract those customers or clients in. So there's always been a need for marketing. So there has always been a need for this investment of time or money or very often both into marketing. I, and social media, yes, does take time, but it doesn't necessarily have to take any more of an investment than other marketing might have done. I think what's happened is that social media has actually thrown the need for marketing into the limelight. And I think there were businesses maybe just getting by on setting up shop and sort of hoping that people would turn up with that sort of strategy. Whereas now, you know, we know that we need to be on social media and people who resisted marketing in the past have now said, right, you know, I've absolutely got to do this. So time has reared its ugly head, but it's actually always been there as part of what was required. So what we need to do 
is really whittle down what needs to be done on social media to the bare essentials and come up with a strategy that actually suits not only the business in terms of what it's trying to sell and who its audience is and everything else like that, but also that suits the resources that that business has available. And very often time and maybe skills will be those that limiting resource. So we do have to obviously adapt our strategies to suit that. But every business has to be able to carve out some investment in marketing or they're going to struggle anyway. So it, it's not just that it has to be actionable, it's that you must absolutely carve out time and effort for social media because it's 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 a marketing channel that you just can't ignore now. Absolutely. And if you, you know, if you really can't do it yourself as a small business, you know, we all know with a small business owner's hat, you know, you've got 101 things that you've actually probably got to do in a day, then try and find somebody who can do it for you, whether you're buying in some time in terms of your own staff or actually outsourcing it to somebody who you know and trust will actually be able to represent your business and your brand out there. But, you know, it's not it's not enough anymore just to make excuses and say, you know, I can't do it because I haven't got this, that and the other. You, you need to have a presence there. Excellent. I think um, it's, it's so important. I don't want to... Um, to, to dwell too long on that you have to do it. But um, also, um, if we think about uh, Ian as well, you have a different point of view working with different businesses. Um, if I could throw the question briefly out to you as well, um, not just about how actionable can social media be, but just touching on some of the other points about time as well. Yeah, yeah it's a great question. And I think, lots of people are going to be lots of people are talking about businesses all the time on social media and so there will be potentially lots of people talking about your business and if you're not on social then you're missing out on all those conversations so i don't think you have to be you know posting loads and loads of stuff all the time it's also about interacting with your audience now when it comes to the time thing i think that's where having a proper strategy having a schedule that you're going to stick to throughout the week maybe you are going to spend half an hour every single day going through twitter and facebook looking at what the conversations are about your about your competitors and about your uh, business as well and you're only spending half an hour every single day or even if you even if you can only spend 15 minutes that's better than nothing so doing doing it that way is going to really really help but also maybe using tools there are social media tools out there that will help you get through your comments really quickly you can delegate some of those messages to uh, virtual assistants or you know people working within your organization your your business so there are loads of ways it doesn't have to be you don't have to spend hours and hours every single day, certainly to begin with, and, and you can be smart with how you manage your social media. Uh, like I, know. So I know for sure yeah. I spend way more than 15 minutes a day just on Instagram. <laughs> I think I spend probably two or three hours a day on Instagram alone. So I can imagine how overwhelming it must feel for businesses. Mm. So Judith, is that just because you like to do it or is it actually uh, has a business and, uh, purpose behind it? Um, the business purpose behind my obsession with Instagram is I'm hoping one day to be Insta famous for my my pictures of cupcakes and chocolate and you know stolen handbags and things. <laughs> that's not you stealing handbags. We no, that's that's, that's me having it stolen. Yeah. It was it was very unfortunate, but it was really cute. So I posted a picture of it. So it lives on forever in my Instagram feed. Ian, is it possible to measure the impact for your business for that type of content? Or is that just something that we're doing to share our own personality um, with not with no ability to actually measure the business ROI from that? Yeah, that's that's a, a really, really important question to ask because we can't we I think a lot of businesses are going on social media for the sake of going on social media and they're posting loads of things without any thought behind it. Uh, but on the on the flip side, I would say it's very difficult to measure the ROI of every single post that you publish. I think social media is more of a long term game that you're playing, and some some posts that you publish will be there's a real clear call to action with a link, and in that sense, in that case, you can absolutely track that, and you should track that absolutely. Uh, whereas for some, it might be more to do with brand awareness or it might just be about growing the number of fans that you have they grow it might be to do with the number of comments you have 
And that is a little bit more tricky to, to track. But certainly what I do is I track the, the obvious, I suppose you call them the vanity statistics, such as the number of followers, the number of likes, the number of comments. Uh, and uh, for, for, for certain posts, I will also track the number of links. Uh, and ultimately, uh, that will lead to the number of customers that I have. But I think it depends on the post and it depends on the length of time you're wanting to do that over. So you're saying it depends on the post. Um, do you have a, a certain strategy that um, looks to deliver certain types of content um, as a percentage of the, the overall posts that mm. you actually publish? Um, or, or, or do you just do what feels like feels right? Yeah, so this is a really interesting question for me because in the past, I'm going to be totally honest here, I've been probably quite lax when it comes to this. I've not, I have had a strategy, but I haven't really stuck to a, a rigid schedule every single week. So one of the things I've I've known that 2019 needs to be for me is to have a real clear strategy uh, for content and a proper content plan for the year. So I've been really excited about getting all of this down. Uh, I've got different themes uh, for my business. I've got uh, two main themes and then within them, there's uh, sub themes, which I'm gonna, uh, I could go into, but it means that every single day I know what type of post that I'm going to be publishing. I know why I'm doing it. And it, it also allows me to know how I can track that. Some of those posts I can, I'll be able to track because there's a clear link that I can track, but some of them will be more to do with brand awareness. So uh, I talk a lot about live video. So some, some of the posts I'll be publishing will be to do with uh, sharing my knowledge and expertise. And it's more about um, the interaction that I have with my audience as opposed to links and uh, that kind of thing. So yeah, that, that's how I'm going to be doing it. I'm, I'm dividing my content into different themes and each one will have a different call to action and a different way of measuring that content. I see that Carlos um, Castro shared in the chat. Um, thanks for pointing it out, Judith. Um, here in Me Mexico, most businesses give more importance to Instagram than any other social media profile, mm -hmm. even in B2B industries. Um, does the panel think that Instagram should be a focus for most businesses? Julia, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, personally, I love Instagram as well. So I spend far too long on it as well because I love my visuals and I love images. And, and that's got to be a part of our social media, hasn't it? Thinking about actually, you know, where where is our audience going to be and what type of content do they love? So I, I definitely fall into the Instagram camp. I mean, certainly in the UK, I've heard a lot of people say that they're jumping off Facebook because of the problems that Facebook encountered last year and they've jumped onto Instagram. Now, whether or not they realize that, you know, Instagram is actually owned by Facebook, I don't know, but we've definitely seen a shift of a significant bunch of people, I would say, from Facebook across to Instagram. So if you are looking to attract those types of people, then I would suggest maybe looking at Instagram as part of your strategy. But I would also say as a business, and especially a small business, you you've got to be able to produce the right sort of content for the platform where you choose to have your presence. So if you're going to be on Instagram, then being able to create images that do capture somebody's attention rather than just sharing, sharing the same old stuff that you're sharing maybe on Facebook or on Twitter. I think Instagram of all places, you've actually got to create something that does attract attention and stands out from the crowd. You need to understand how the platform works. You probably to get the most out of it you're probably going to have to invest some time and effort also in instagram stories so yes i would suggest looking at instagram and thinking about whether your target audience is on there but do also look at the type of content you're going to need to produce to be able to do well on that platform and also to stand out from the mm -hmm. crowd there and what you were saying there julie does that apply to b2b as well yes there are some b2b's doing really well on instagram Absolutely. I mean, in our field, David, I'm sure you've you've come across a few of them that are doing really well. But I mean, people like HubSpot are doing really well. You wouldn't necessarily think of them. You know, they sell a software. You wouldn't think of them as being able to necessarily come across in, in great visuals, but they do. And there are lots of other people um, along the, the same along the same track in terms of B2B thinking a bit more creatively, say, about how they can actually put their, their vision across in such a way that they attract an audience, that they build loyalty, that they build advocacy. I think 
Instagram per se, the news feed, is maybe more than any other platform, although, you know, I'm very, very happy to hear alternative views, but it's maybe more than any other platform, a place where you can really start to build a lot of loyalty and a lot of advocacy with your audience by attracting engagement and going out and engaging yourself with others. You said, Julia, that you weren't too sure if um, people knew that Instagram was actually owned by Facebook when you see a lot of people yeah. moving over from Facebook to Instagram. Do you think that if, mo if everyone actually knew that that would actually be part of their decision making process regarding what platform they're using? Or do they think do you think that they just want a great user experience? It doesn't matter the um, the beliefs behind the um, the, the company that um, are, um, are are owning it. I think there's a little bit of both, personally. I think you'll get some people that, if they found out, would just would you know storm off in a hissy fit and say, "Right, that's it. You know, I'm done." Because you know, I've heard a few of them. I'm done with both of them. You know, don't want anything more to do with them. And I think others have maybe used it as a reason to look at another platform and maybe wouldn't worry so much um, that it was owned by Facebook, but just do like much more of the visual approach. Some people that I've worked with. Um, I work with a network marketing company, so I actually help some of the distributors out there. They kind of feel that maybe Facebook isn't giving them the response now that it used to, say, a couple of years ago. So they want to move across to Instagram because of the reach that they can have there, not necessarily as marketers, but just actually going out there and, and reaching people, reaching their friends. You know, I've got, and it depends on the demographic you're talking about. I've got children my oldest is 21 and she definitely doesn't use facebook anymore but her and her friends and my my younger children as well are all on instagram Incredible. ian one thing uh, sorry ian one thing that you were, we're seeing at the moment um and we have seen over the last couple of years is the incredible pickup of live video on social media what are some people or some brands or some ways of doing things that um, are the right ways um, of doing this? And uh, is there any way that um, brands can actually um, use that as really a significant part of the, the brand building or other measurable um, ways of, 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 of measuring success of live video? Well, yes, I, there, are, there are a lot of businesses out there that are again jumping on the bandwagon seeing live video is a great way of uh a new piece of a new, new format of content and uh just putting it out there for, for the sake of it but i think where brands are getting live video is where they're looking at the power of i'm going to use this word and it's overused so apologies but authenticity i know everyone talks about it but so many of us as consumers of content are frustrated by overly slick marketing videos. And we've become quite um, dismissive of them. We, we don't believe them. And we don't believe the claims in some of these videos. And so live video, we as consumers find it, we trust them a lot more because, because people are live and mistakes can happen. And so the brands that are using live video well, yes, they are being professional about it, they're producing live video in a professional way, yet they are embracing their humanity. They are not editing out their mistakes. They are talking about their brand, but more importantly, engaging with their audience. And that's the other really important thing about live video. It's a two-way communication. Although the audience aren't necessarily on the screen, they are being able to interact with the brand uh, with comments and so again the, the best brands the brands that are doing this in the best way are the ones that are actually responding to comments bringing the comments onto screen and and uh, building a community and this is something that mark zuckerberg this is you know particularly on facebook where with he's wanting to build more of a community and the reach of posts uh, there's a lot more of a weight being put on the number of comments and the interactivity between friends on posts and so i think that is where that's where it's at that's where uh, brands are doing really good jobs on whether it's on facebook youtube or instagram uh, and that, that's definitely i think what we should be focusing on definitely interesting about embracing your uh, mortality almost so to speak yes. you, your your failures your mistakes and and your eyeliner that's just a little bit wonky and you you didn't check before you went live 
<laughs> well, it's funny, isn't it? Because we, I think, I, I, I'm sure we're all guilty of this. We all want things to be perfect. We, we don't want things to go wrong. We want to look great. I mean, this is one of, interestingly, one of the problems with Instagram that we're seeing, you know, in terms of mental health, a lot of people are, uh, there's some research that shows that uh, Instagram is actually giving the kind of the worst mental health for, for people because we're comparing ourselves with these perfect looking people. But Insta uh, sorry, uh, live video is kind of the opposite of that. It's, or should be, it's a bit more of the raw humanity. Uh, and some of the best live videos actually we've done, Julia, because Julia and I uh, have to do a live show every week, the Free Range Social Show. And some of the best times have actually been when things have gone wrong. Uh, sure. Not always. I have to say, go wrong. Actually, it's it's funny and it shows the human side of us. Uh, well, we you know we are human, but uh, it, when mistakes happen, it does show the more human side of of us and our businesses. And it, very interesting as well is thinking about what we were talking about before we went on air about what kind of content turns people off on social media. Um, and I, I'd I'd love to to hear from both uh, yourself, Ian and Julia about um, this type of question, because while we're seeing uh, this move towards more authenticity, I think, mm -hmm. especially from what I can see, but what what is turning people off on social media? Mm, that's another, I love these questions. They're great. Yeah. Uh, they're making, making us think. So I think it depends, <clears throat> excuse me, on your audience, because sometimes actually turning people off can be a good thing depending on your business because you want to repel the people that are not a good fit for your for your business you don't want you want to repel the nightmare customers potentially and you want to attract the people uh, that you want so for example there are certain things that are controversial such as on live video what you know swearing or political or religious views things like that which are going to divide people some people are going to love you some people are going to hate you now in general, I would say those kinds of things are, are usually not good. Those are things that will put people off. But for certain brands, it might be a good fit. So I think it, it kind of depends. But uh, certain things that are overall bad in terms of live video content are just where it's just somebody like a talking head uh, in front of the video, in front of the camera, where they are speaking on a monotone. And there's just no energy there at all. It's very, very boring. Now, the content might be great, but because there's no uh, passion or excitement uh, in front of the camera, people are just going to turn off. There's also just really bad uh, when the technology is not working. So people can forgive maybe slightly dodgy video, but if they can't hear you, if, if the audio is all crackly or if, if, you're, if you've forgotten to put the microphone on, which <clears throat> may have happened to me the other day, but uh, if, if, you know, if those kind of things, people aren't going to stay for very long because they, you know, their time is very precious. And uh, so I would say things like that um, definitely would put, put a lot of people off. I'm sure, Julia, you've got loads of um, ideas here. Well, I have got some. I mean, there've been some. There've been some studies done actually on why people unfollow brands on social media, and you know, one of the reasons is that brands don't respond to them at all. But another really big reason is that businesses aren't actually sharing the content that their audiences mm -hmm. want. The, you know, the, it's it's being shown time and again that people actually go onto social media because they want to be entertained and and they want to be maybe challenged and they want to you know connect with their friends and they want to hear the news and all that sort of stuff but the kind of content they want for brands is actually something that's going to help add value to their lives help them live their lives better and if as brands and businesses we're not actually sharing stuff that helps them do that then in very general terms people might very well go off and and find somebody else to follow so we do need to think about turning it on its head and actually think about what it is that our audience wants rather than what is it that we want to share. But the other thing that I think we're bumping up against time and time again now in as we go into 2019 is actually people's context. I've just seen a post go out in face, on Facebook actually posted by David Lloyd who run um, a whole series of gyms over in this country. And as they're just like literally promoting themselves. And I can't remember what the text was. Oh, that was it. Something about teamwork and the dream work or something like that. The image that went with it was two 
youngish girls with amazing figures, kind of stage, looking very staged, but looking as they're, they're standing there taking a selfie in the middle of this gym. And they have got a whole massive raft of negative comments underneath this photo because people are coming back and saying you're meant to be inclusive you know you've given us this promise as a brand of being inclusive of supporting us to do our best and then you're just sharing photos of people who are obviously perfect you know in in the audience's eyes and we don't like that so I think as you know as we go into 2019 we're going to see more of this we're going to see brands kind of maybe promising one thing and actually really upsetting their customers by forgetting that in their social media and by presenting something that doesn't actually match the context of their customers or clients. So that's a, a very deep topic in itself. Um, how do you actually go about um, matching what your customers are likely to be looking for? Is it about the brand establishing who the personas are uh, to begin with? Yeah, I think it's definitely thinking about who it is, obviously, that you, you want to be attracting. And personas are a good place to start. But I think we have to go deeper. We have to try as brands and businesses to, if possible, actually interview, actually talk to some of our customers and our clients and get to the nitty gritty of things and find out things like, you know, actually what their aspirations are, you know, what their ambitions are, what gets them out of bed in the morning, what do they love, what do they hate, what other brands do they like, you know, where do they, how do they, you know, what, where do they function from, if you like, in terms of their lives and what it, what is it that is encouraging them not necessarily to buy from us, but to be attracted to us in the first place. What is it that they love about us? Because very often what defines our brand isn't necessarily what we're putting out there. It's actually what other people's perception is of that. So if we can find out what it is that people love about us in the first place, that can help us to do more of that and exaggerate and amplify that and actually build on what our customers love. I mean, there's a whole raft of questions that that you can go out there with obviously there's quite a nice there's a job a job there's a book about Steve Jobs and about how he approached giving his speeches his presentations and one part of that came up with a brilliant question and it was all about actually what do you save what or who do you save your customers from and I think that's a brilliant starting point for not only maybe having a conversation with your customers or your clients, but actually brainstorming within the business, because you can really start to get under many more of those emotions and feelings and aspirations that way than asking the same old boring marketing questions. Some wonderful tips there. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, just in a minute or so, um, I'm going to ask um, Ian and um Julia, both for an actionable takeaway. So that actionable takeaway can be in relation to what we're talking about um, on this particular episode, or it can be something else that you happen to be thinking about in your current um, business day-to-day -day lives. Um, but just before we get to that, um, I'd like to just revert back to, or um, I'd like to go back to where we were with our conversation about live video. Now, there's a lot of incredible content that is produced uh, using live video, but a lot of brands perhaps don't use that um, recording in as an efficient way as possible. Um, Ian, what are your thoughts um, when a brand um, has gone live, what they should do with that content? Overly excited by the live aspects of live video because obviously, that's the main focus of it. But a lot of brands forget once you've ended that broadcast, it then becomes on YouTube and Facebook and Instagram, it becomes a regular post, a regular video. So first of all, I would create a community around that one post, make it into a piece of evergreen content, go back and answer the questions that people have asked or get involved with the, the comments. But you can also add some show notes to, to the, the post, and you could also repurpose that video into a plethora of content across all the different networks out there. Now, there are tools out there that can just take the video from Facebook or, and YouTube and bung it on another net, other channel like YouTube. But I think if you're going to be smart about it, I think you have to do things like ed edit it down or take snippets out of it. So one thing that I do is I tip my live video I, uh, 
will take little 10, 15 second clips from it and post that to an Instagram story, obviously cropping it first. Uh, some of it may well work as an Instagram um, regular post, put something on LinkedIn. Uh, you could also edit it, taking away some of the live aspects of it. Uh, um, what I mean by that is if you're, if you're welcoming live viewers, for example, that's not gonna be that interesting to replay viewers. So just take the core content out of your live video and publish that to YouTube and uh, create lots of content from that one piece of content. One of the things I love about live video from a creation point of view, for, for me creating this, is that it's actually, once you've sorted out all that technology, it's a really quick and easy way of producing that content. It's obviously you will do some planning, but once you hit that record button, it's you and your guest or whatever you're doing, creating that piece of content. And so from that, you can then create blog posts, you can put it on LinkedIn and Instagram and, and stories and you name it, you can do it. As But I see so many brands just posting the, the live video and they think their job is done. Julia, and in relation to that, um, you mentioned quite a few platforms that you could share your content on afterwards once it's been broken down. Um, you mentioned LinkedIn, uh, Instagram stories. Is, is there any particular platform that is particularly effective for publishing short snippets of video content at the moment? Short snippets of video, yes, LinkedIn. I mean, LinkedIn and video at the moment is a match made in heaven. I don't know if you've seen Gary V. He's been um, shouting all over the place about go, go and use LinkedIn, guys, because the organic reach is still brilliant. You know, before the algorithm gets like Facebook's and, and where Instagram's is heading to as well, go and make the most of LinkedIn's organic reach. So, if you are in B two B and you're on LinkedIn, then yes, video is going to be great for you over there but tiny little snippets on Twitter as well. I think poor old Twitter gets forgotten in the excitement of, of some of these other networks, whereas video, of course, on Twitter works really well, but you can only post tiny little short videos, which is great because Twitter is all about the little snippets, isn't it? So I would use both and stories. Yes, that's something I want to talk about in my actionable tips, so I might leave it for that. Yeah, and also I see that um, Tarun in the chat is saying, um, do IGTV, would, um, would that be actually helpful in the future for businesses? So perhaps you can cover that very quickly in the actual tip, um, Julia. Well, yeah, I will do, sure. <laughs> well, let's um, move um, over to Ian for the first one, though. Um, and um, so this is an actual tip not necessarily related to what we've been discussing so far in this episode. Um, Ian, what is your actual tip? So I think if you haven't embraced live video yet, there's usually one of three barriers that people struggle with. It's either a lack of confidence in front of the camera, maybe you're scared, it may be a lack of uh, confidence with the technology, or it could be you just don't know what to share, it's the content. Well, I think the best way to start is in one sense, just do it. Just create some video content and go to Facebook, go to your profile, uh, click live and change the privacy settings to only me and just try it. Try going live for three or four minutes. Obviously come up with some uh, some vague plan beforehand. Three points is, is a really good uh, way of starting. Once you've done that, I, I recommend joining together with some other business owners in a group and set yourself a challenge. Say for five, seven days, say you're gonna go live every single day. The first few videos you do, will not be good, I promise you. Like mine were, uh, I'm sure D David's first live videos were absolutely perfect, but most of us, <laughs> they, they, they weren't. So start off and create some content and from the mistakes and from the flaws that you discover, you will create some amazing content over time, but just get started. Great advice. Uh, you can find Ian over iag.me. And now it's Julia's turn. Uh, Julia, what is your actionable tip? Well. 2019 is seeing marketing, social media marketing, going from being a very sort of broadcast public type thing to much more of a personalized approach if we really want to see success for our businesses. And nothing does this better in my book than the stories format. And we know that Instagram stories have taken off just madly, you know, they're madly popular. And we know that Facebook has introduced stories to the the Facebook platform now and they are pushing and promoting them really hard and LinkedIn is also going to be bringing in stories format on their platform because it is such a great way to be able to share content in a way that feels much more intimate to the person who then views that content but it's also stories are also a great way to start conversations 
And to my mind, if we can be sharing content out on social media in 2019 that start the conversation, if we can go from content to conversation, that's going to be our big win in business this year. So if you haven't started using the stories format yet, a bit like Ian with live, then please do go and try out the stories format. Get to grips with it on whatever platform you want to. Certainly on Instagram and on Facebook, you can create a little segment of a story. And just like Ian was saying with his live, you don't have to go and share it straight away. You can create a little segment, save it to your phone, have a look at it, see what you think of it before you then decide to post it. But whatever you do, do start just getting used to this very different way maybe of representing your business on social media. Make the most of it and don't forget that you can also use the story format to listen to people that you would love to have a conversation with in terms of business and respond to them because stories start one-to-one -one conversations. So you'll be talking to real people behind that story. So you can use it to share your stuff, but you can also use it to start conversations with other people that you would really like to converse with in terms of business. So please do get started with that. And I know I was um, asked that question about IGTV. I actually jumped straight onto IGTV when it launched because I just thought, brilliant, here is something new. There's a new format. We can share videos of up to 10 minutes. It's within Instagram. I love Instagram. It's been quite limited so far in the amount of video that we can share. But actually, it's been really difficult for anyone to actually discover our IGTV videos, unless we are Gary V or you know somebody of that ilk. So I would say, if you're thinking about video, by all means, go and produce them on IGTV, but use that as a source of content then to share elsewhere, just like Ian was saying with the lives. Don't rely just on IGTV. You've got to send people to it. But more than that, I would use it as a bank of content that you break down, just as Ian has said. So you've got a presence there. So if it ever does take off, fab you're there but you're also reusing repurposing that content elsewhere as well fantastic that's some uh incredible advice uh you can also find julia over at bramblebuzz.co.uk i'll tell you what we're getting some incredible um interaction going on in the chat um we're getting people recommend using twitch or um talking about people who are gamers who have used twitch and then posted the content to youtube also people asking a little bit about reddit and considering that as a content marketing um opportunity as well um if you dear listener are listening to this an audio podcast and would like to participate in a future episode please go to seumrush.com slash webinars and then you can see the upcoming episodes the topics we're going to cover and then sign up uh, to watch it live but for the show, I've been your co-host, David Bain. You can also find me over at digitalmarketingradio.com. And I've been Judith Lewis, your other co-host. And you can find me at decabit.com. We'll be recording the next episode, season two, episode 15 of this scoop at the same time, same place, the SEO Rush YouTube channel on Wednesday, the 23rd of January for a show that will focus on how to market a podcast. Joining us live will be Mark Asquith from Rebel Base Media and Deepak Shukla from Pearl Lemon. So make sure you join us for that. If you liked what you heard today, make sure to subscribe to the audio podcast too. Just head over to scmrush.com forward slash podcast and find the link there to your favorite show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Android, and all other good podcast stores. But until next time, be fantabulous and do one thing that scares you. Adios.